folks. Finishing up this um, lecture, this kind of introductory lecture on spectroscopy. So this one will probably be shorter than um, the last one. So, um, and then what's coming next, um, we're gonna talk about rotational spectroscopy, and then vibrational spectroscopy, and then electronic spectroscopy, as you may have guessed from the way I organize uh, the class. Um, so let's keep going with this um, introductory uh, information, kind of select content from chapter 12 and 13. Um, so, and what I want to get into is something um, that I think is really important for applied spectroscopy. So, um, background versus sample spectra, okay? So, I'll, I'll remind you, I'm actually going to back up just for a second, okay? And I'll remind you of all of these various um, photophysical processes that are occurring when light interacts with the sample. So we can get reflection. That reflection can be specular um, or diffuse, uh, depending on the quality of our surface. Um, we can get refraction if the light is passing through multiple different types of media, which it certainly is in spectroscopy, right? It passes through the air, and then it passes through your glass cuvette, and then it passes through uh, the liquid in your cuvette, and then on and out through the other side. Um, we can also get diffraction, right, when there is a small opening. So all of these processes are important to consider, which is precisely why we take a background spectrum and then a sample spectrum, okay? So these are typically referred to as single beam spectra. So whether it's the background or the sample, uh, we call these single beam because um, we're, you know, colloquially we're passing one beam at a time. Technically we're doing a lot more than that. Um, but these are called single beams um, because we're going to ratio each of these two. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> mm. We're going to ratio each of these two single beam spectra to each other. And here's why. Well, look, when our light comes in and starts interacting with the cuvette, we're going to get specular reflection. We're going to get diffuse reflection. We're going to get refraction coming through the cuvette. And also, all of these processes are going to occur on the other side of the cuvette. Okay. And so all of these will contribute to light not making it to our detector, right? If we, if we think about this, right, this is my uh, transmitted, or excuse me, my incident beam and my transmitted beam. And my transmitted beam won't reflect what has been absorbed. It will just, uh, it will just represent what light hasn't made it to the detector, which could be from the absorbance but it also could be from all of these scattering events, okay? So the way we get around with that is we first record a background. So this will be identical to the sample um, as much as possible, okay? So typically, if we can, we would want to use the same cuvette. Um, if we can't use the same cuvette um, because we want to keep running multiple samples, then at the very least, we would do some type of study to figure out how different each cuvette is from the next, right? If there's little bad spots in the glass that contribute to scattering, we would want to um, maybe throw one of those cuvettes out and use a more pristine one Okay, so we want to try to make this as identical to the sample as possible. And so if this were a solution, so let's suppose if the sample were some type of solution, then my background would be the solvent of that solution. And then the only difference between my background and sample 
would be I will replace my pure solvent with a solution of analyte solutes in that same solvent that I did for the background. So we'll say analyte equals the solute, okay? And as I often tell my own research students, if you stand on one foot while singing a song in your head, while recording the background spectrum, then stand on one foot and sing that same song in your head while recording the sample, okay? I am a paranoid scientist. And so to really ratio out all of these photophysical effects that can occur, your background and your sample need to be as identical as possible with the exception, of course, your sample has analyte molecules in them, okay? So for example, in the solvent solution example, we wouldn't want to have blank air in here. We would want to truly have a matching solvent, okay? And so now the way that this works out, um, right, my uh, transmitted or my incident beam, excuse me, I keep mixing that up. My incident beam I0 and I0 will be the same if we've done this as identically as possible. Um, and of course my uh, transmitted beam will not be identical to this. So when I'm ratioing these out, it becomes a ratio of a ratio, right? I take the, um, the absorbance spectrum is literally the negative log of now this I, this transmitted beam, to this I naught, okay? Um, because when we record these single beams, we're technically taking, um, for absorbance, right, the negative log of, uh, let's see the best way to represent this. So I'll have an I over I naught and an I over I naught, right? And um, so one of these, uh, so one of these I naughts will cancel. Okay, so I, I should have labeled this and thought about this more clearly. But um, one of these will cancel because it's identical um, with the other. And so we'll have a true like ratio of ratios. So we will have ratioed out all of those effects. Okay. So um, we can have single beam spectrometers or double beam. Single beam are by far the most common because they're the easiest to construct. Um, and in a single beam spectrometer, right, we'd have a light source with some type of collimator. So that could be a slit like you see right here, or it could be a set of optics that can focus the beam down onto our monochromonitor. Okay. Oh, I knew I spelled monochromonitor wrong. Oh my gosh. Wait, let's see. You guys probably caught me on that. Yes. It's not a chronometer, that's a watch. Duh. Um, I told you guys I couldn't spell. Um, so the collimator or set of optics, right, focus the light on the monochromometer, monochromometer, whatever, the diffraction grating, right? And that diffraction grating might come out divergent. So we'll use another slit um, to diffract the beam into a nice tight collimated path so that it can pass over our sample and go on to our detector. And so now I know that all of you are familiar with this. When you want to get an actual spectrum, you would first take a single beam of your background, then usually the software records it, stand on one foot, right, hold your breath, all the other superstitious things. Then you would replace your background cuvette with your sample cuvette, stand on one foot, hold your breath, cross your fingers, right, do all the stuff. Um, and then your uh, computer system, your detector, will work out that ratio of ratios to give you the true absorbance or transmittance spectra, okay? So the really fancy spectrometers are double beam instruments where you will load in your reference, and this says air or cuvette. Um, cuvette containing the solvent is what I recommend. Um, and then your sample, right? And again, we hope that this 
uh, reference or this background is as identical as possible to the sample. And so now this is pretty cool. So this setup is almost identical to the single beam, except for now we have here, um, you can see M1 is a beam splitter, right? So half the light will go down this way and half will go down this way. So um, the half that goes through the reference will just pass right through what's uh, called this grid mirror. And this grid mirror allows light to pass through from one side. So it's transparent on one side um, and it's opaque on the other side, okay? Um, so the light will pass right through the reference and onto the detector, great. Um, and also simultaneously, the light will pass through. Um, so it'll go down to this mirror. These are just ordinary reflecting mirrors. And so that'll pass through the sample. And then of course your um, software, right? Your, your, the computer program will work out this absorbance specter for you. And of course, that being said, if this is a dispersion technique, which this definitely is, so I'll make sure that we note that this is um, dispersion spectroscopy, right? Because we're using a grading. Um, so these things right, will scan one wavelength at a time, okay? Um, and whether that be from angling the diffraction grading or angling the light source, or what I didn't talk about last time, um, we are getting to the point where we have more sophisticated detectors that can discriminate wavelengths of light. Um, but those types of detectors still aren't nearly as good at resolving different wavelengths of light as changing the angle of our diffraction grading, okay? Um, so if you have a double beam instrument, these things are great. These things um, are very easy to use. You typically don't have as much um, background sample issues, right? If your background and sample weren't identical with the exception of the analyte molecules, then you have less of those issues with the double beam instrument, okay? Um, so moving on. So I wanna talk about a really, really cool modern technique in spectroscopy which um, you likely haven't talked about in any of your classes. And this is taking advantage of doing single beam spectroscopy. So we call this difference or sometimes action spectroscopy. And so the idea here is we're still, so this is still very much a single beam instrument, okay? Except for our, um, uh, uh, excuse me, our background single beam spectra and sample single beam spectra are truly identical. So meaning that we would have analyte molecules here, as well as analyte molecules here. And now in between these two samples, so in between the time that I record the initial uh, background single beam, And sample single beam, I've done some chemistry, okay? And so if anything happens to that sample in between these two conditions, then the, orb, the absorption spectra will only reflect the changes that happened. So that's why we call this difference spectroscopy, right? And, and one really good way to note, what, so what you kind of expect out of these spectra all right, so if let's say nothing happens, literally we don't do a single thing from the background to sample. So we just leave it in there, we record a single beam, we don't do anything, we record another single beam, and we take the negative log ratio of those two single beams, right? So just I'll remind you, right, to do an absorbance, we would take the negative log ratio of condition two over condition one, the single beam spectra. So if nothing happens between, then we'll just get a blank line. And I'm gonna draw it with kind of like some noise, right? Cause it won't be like a perfectly um, blank line. You know, there'll be some noise. And I'll say that that blank line will occur exactly at zero absorbance because the negative log of one equals zero. 
right? So if, if these two spectra are identical, then ratioing them won't reveal any changes took place, okay? And so we'll say this is absorbance, and we'll say this is wavelength, all right? So now let's suppose that something happens, that we do some chemistry uh, in situ with the spectrometer, right? So um, that could be accomplished by some convoluted apparatus that allows us to flow reactant molecules into that cuvette, or it even could be something as simply as just spiking our sample with something in between these two conditions, right? If that doesn't give an appreciable volume change, right? Suppose we just spike, you know, like one microliter of a reactant, uh, that won't have changed the volume all that much. And so we'll see some chemistry happen. So now our absorbance spectra will no longer be a blank line. Rather, we will get um, positive features if some new, let's say, functional group appears as a result of the chemistry. All right. And also, we will see negative features indicating that there's been a loss of some functional group, or even um, if this were UV vis, right? We don't see functional groups in UV vis, but rather we would just see a peak associated with the chemical bond that was lost and a peak associated with the chemical bond that was gained. And so in this case, you know, a positive absorbance and a negative absorbance are very significant. They mean that something has been gained or something has been lost. Um, so I wanna share some results with you from one of the first papers um, that did this, um, 2007. Um, this is from uh, the Finlayson Pitts group. They're an atmospheric chemistry group at UC Irvine where I went to graduate school. So um, the Finlayson Pitts group is uh, you know, world renowned at being atmospheric chemistry spectroscopists. So um, Dr. Finlayson Pitts, um, more or less perfected this technique. So it was very cool to get to, to learn it from her. Um, so this is a fantastic example. So this is um, an IR spectrum, so it's, it's Fourier transform. Um, but what's important to note, it's a fantastic demonstration of this difference spectroscopy, okay? So in this reaction, there's some sodium sulfite and sodium sulfite is oxidized uh, by ozone and other oxidizing agents of the like to make sodium sulfate, okay, plus some oxygen to be stoichiometrically correct, all right? And so the way this experiment goes, you've got sodium sulfite as your sample, um, and you record a single beam spectrum of that, and to get this sulfite peak, this also had to be ratioed to a blank sample. So this is like a ratio of a ratio of ratios, okay? Um, so otherwise, if it had only been condition one, condition two, this would be uh, a blank line, okay? So you can get a little bit more sophisticated than just two conditions. You can add a third condition to get yourself the initial starting peak, right? So now what happens is ozone is pumped into the sample chamber, okay? And I'm gonna, I'll show you some technical aspects of this um, later on in the week's talks so of how you can achieve this. But in any event, gas phase ozone is flowed over the surface of this sample, which initiates the reaction, and successive single beam spectra are recorded in time. And you can see in this example, one at five minutes and one at 15 minutes. And what's really cool is you can see at, after five minutes, um, which is this gray one, um, I'll get a different color so we can see it. The sulfite peak has reduced, okay? And, and by reduced, I mean um, its intensity is going down, okay? Um, and also you can see here, this region is where the sulfate peak would be. Um, and its intensity is going up. And under further reaction, now the sulfite peak has more or less completely been titrated away, so it's gone. 
Um, and now it's been replaced with solfate. So this is a really, really cool way to prove a mechanism um, because you're seeing simultaneously the destruction of functional groups and the creation of new functional groups. Um, and so this is a different paper here, same group, but different system. Um, and actually this goes back to 2002, so this wasn't quite the original. Um, but for, for several, several decades they spent, uh, several years I should say, they spent perfecting this technique. Okay. Um, and so this is a fantastic demonstration that actually shows a true uh, action spectra where the, the T equals zero spectra is just a blank line. You can kind of see it right there, right? And then it gets noisy as you get into the uh, smaller wave numbers. Um, but now you can truly see here the loss of some functional groups, right? And the gain of other functional groups, which again is so cool for your chemistry and your kinetics and doing your mechanisms. Really, really cool technique. Um, and I'll plug my own lab. We have the ability to do this technique in my own research lab. Um, so um, I'll spend some more time talking about that later on in the week. Okay, and so that's a good place to stop um, because where I'm going next um, is getting into pure rotational spectroscopy. After that, we'll talk about pure vibrational spectroscopy. Um, after that, we'll see how the rotations and the vibrations actually sync together to do row vibrational spectroscopy, so simultaneous rotational vibrational spectroscopy. Um, and then at the end of the semester, the last few weeks, we'll get into the electronic spectroscopy. Okay, folks, uh, I'll see you in the next video.